Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. My name's... Oh, thank you. You'd be pleased to know I'm not going to dance. My name is Anita Heiss. I'm a Wiradjuri woman from central New South Wales. I'm a Williams from Cowra, Brungle, Mission, Griffith and Tumut. And I'm privileged to be here this evening on the land of the Turbul and Yagara peoples, sharing a stage with some of Australia's top choreographers. I'm going to be joined this evening by Stephen Page, Jasmine Shepherd, Daniel Riley and Bodine Riley-Smith. We've got about 30 minutes to have a yarn. In that time, we will take some questions from the floor. I understand there's some school groups in the audience this evening. So this is your... I think they're all sitting up the back. But this is... Hi. This is your chance to ask questions. And some of the answers you won't find on Google. So make the most of the opportunity. I think we're going to have roving mics. Are we having roving mics? Maybe? I think we're going to have roving mics. So, th three of our choreographers were dancers tonight, so they're currently getting changed. They'll join us shortly. But what I'd like to do first up is to invite to the stage the patriarch of the Bangara family, the man who has led the artistic direction for 25 years, um, a nukunul, oh, sorry, a new knuckle Mullinjali man. Please welcome Mr. Stephen Page. And I, Hello. Should, I should say, actually, Dr. Stephen Page, because in 2015, <laughs> he was awarded... I might sit here. Well, I, I should sit here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was oh, awarded was choreographed. We an sat together. honorary doctorate from UTS. Is that right? I think so. If anybody uh, from UTS is listening, <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Good evening. Yeah. I think the other three dancers are ready too, but they can wait. Are they? Yeah. They can wait. Yeah, yeah. okay. I could have spent 30 minutes just going through your list of achievements and awards in the last 25 years. But what I thought I'd do really quickly, because there's so many, is just let the audience know what's happened in the last couple of months, because um, I'd like that to be recognised. So, in June, um, Bangara, led by Stephen, of course, won an Outstanding Performance Award by, uh, by company at the Australian Dance Awards for the production Fire, a retrospective. Only a few weeks later, I was one of over 1,600 people sitting in the Darwin Convention Centre as Stephen was awarded the 2016 National Nano Lifetime Achievement Award for, I think, say a round of applause, <laughs> for his decades of work in the area. Now, if you haven't had a chance to see Stephen's speech online, I urge you to watch it. I've watched it a few times, Stephen. Some might call that stalking. I use it as a motivational um, video. And for the teachers in the room, it's something you could show your classes as well. Most recently, Stephen was awarded the 2016 JC Williamson Award for outstanding contribution to the enrichment of Australia's live performance culture. So these... Thing. I was going to say, can we start with a round of applause? But there you go. I think Stephen, in my view, I may be slightly biased, he continues to inspire, he's a mentor, and his work opens the doors for, of dance for younger generations. I'm a writer by trade, so I've written myself notes. Now, Stephen, when, you, when we look back at your repertoire, or is that, I don't know what you call it in the dance world, we call it a publications list, but <laughs> tonight we saw... Um, Napanyapa Unipingu, it was your 23rd production that you've choreographed. I'm interested to know, we have, we are fortunate in our mob and in Australia to have a long list of internationally renowned, um, brilliant artists that you could draw inspiration from. And so my question for you tonight is, what was it about the life and artwork of uh, Napanyapa that inspired you to create the beautiful piece we just, we just saw? Yeah, oh, look, uh, with Nyapa Nyapa, obviously the, um, the families, uh, the Yidapingus and the Marikas and the Manyayans, there are lots of families in North East Arnhem Land who have been quite instrumental uh, with their traditional song and dance and knowledge and they have entrusted Bangara over many years. And Jakapura Mayanyan was a dancer with Bangara, he was a culture consultant, he was a song man with Bangara. You would have heard his voice tonight in the Nyapa Nyapa soundscape. There's a beautiful noise going on. Uh, can you hear, or you can hear me okay? Yeah, so I should ignore it? Yeah, okay, fine. It's not part of the show. No, it could be a new soundscape that's for our next show, maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, the families were instrumental, Jakapura's been instrumental, and uh, 
Nyapa Nyapa um, started her career quite late as a visual artist and she was known, uh, she won the Telstra Award in 2008 and you might have your program there and there it is, the planes landed. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think, well, there are a couple of things. We, we go back to Yurikala in northeast Arnhem Land, which is a, a, a community just outside of Nullumboy, and um, we perform there. We've been performing there for many years, and it's really our gift back to the families of, of Yurikala and northeast, um, northeast Arnhem Land. And a lot of the different homelands come in, and Nyapa Nyapa is always there. She's, uh, you know, she, she's, she's a, an artist that paints in the gallery every day, the Yurikala Art Gallery, and she's always in the corner painting. And just for years, I've been wanting to do her works, and... Um, Talk to Jakapura about it, and Jake Nash, who is the set designer of, of all three works. Him and I have always admired her work. So the opportunity came, but the opportunity wouldn't have come if it wasn't for really, I think, Jessie's work, Mac, because um, the Jess's work that she created in 2013 as a workshop a part of Dance Clan in Sydney, which was only seen in Sydney. Um, it was great to give Jasmine the opportunity with Mac to have a main stage season. So with that being a, 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 a work of like 23, 24 minutes, I knew I had to have other works connected to that. I'd, and I only saw Nyapa Nyapa a work of, you know, a few, mainly her buffalo story was the big one that was the jumping jump off board of, of me wanting to create a work. And then it was just looking at other sort of artworks of her artworks that would um, basically hold up as a dance response on stage. And so I could go on it forever. The sets are extraordinary. So yeah, look, it was been... more the visual feast, really, because I think Bangara's works have been lights and, and costumes and, and set, stu set design has been a, a huge part of our storytelling. But also I think uh, there's that theatrical experience that you get with a Bangara show as well as the choreography. You get all the other sort of design elements. So uh, in a way I was a bit challenged and frightened that her... Visuals, you could just light them up with some beautiful soundscape and maybe not have any dance and you can just have a beautiful <laughs> curation of visual art. <laughs> <Now, laughs> Probably might work better than what I've created. Nyapa no. Nyapa um, was it opening night in Sydney? Is that correct? Or in Perth? No, we, we opened the season of Owl in Sydney for... Yeah, but I meant the artist. The artist, she came yes, to Sydney? Sydney. Yes, she, I wonder what was her reaction Well, I, I don't know. She, she was quiet. Look, she's 75 and she says very little and she doesn't speak English. So... Um, she uh, she just had a smile and she was she came on stage and she took a bow with everybody and uh, I think she was just totally overwhelmed. I think her images, obviously the Buffalo story is um, the, um, the 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 bark painting that won the Telstra Award and I, I think what um, struck me and fascinated me more about that painting was the motifs and the crosshatch and the dots are a very familiar style with the Yungle people and usually they would draw on their totemic system or mythological stories and creation stories and paint in that in those motifs and designs and the fact that she told a story that happened about uh, to her at 29 years of age when she was in the late 70s and she was gorged by a water buffalo walking through a bush apple trees on the way back from turtle hunting with two sisters um, and she met a big water buffalo and it was between her and that creature and she unfortunately got attacked by the water buffalo and so she told this personal story out on this piece of bark through the Yungle traditional motif. And I thought that was really interesting because usually here's this personal story being told through through these motifs. So it started off from there. So I was worried about that she would have nightmares again by because I think after she painted she said to her head curator, Oh I don't want to paint this any anymore, even though she won prizes for um, that personal story being told on Bark. She never ever wanted to paint another buffalo again. And uh, so I was a bit uh, frightened that she, if she could go through the live experience of that image and it played out in this sort of physical choreographic pantomime in a way. Um, but we also had the, the cherry or the... Oh, the bush apple the trees. The bush apple trees, yeah. we had that after. And then we had the Wendy's, which I call the black um, cutout girls, young girls. And I think they might have been echoes of herself through the bush apple trees um, and the bush apple trees obviously were the, the leaves that were on the, the background so a lot of her, the repetition of her motifs were played out. Um, I think after the buffalo story there, there was lots of the one subject and then it played out repetitiously in her paintings so those abstract versus the sort of narration of her stories, um, yeah, is what is inspiring. And then we just selected about six and we went for it. And then the lizards all coming into one, that was about her winning the award and then going back to the community and everyone was fussing over her being famous, but she didn't like that. And um, 
I think they all wanted her prize money. Um, but uh, no, get away from me, Lyd, that's my money. Um, and so all that's about humbugging. <laughs> and and like, as we all do, we go back, you know, we can go and be uptown blackfellas in the city and then we go back to community and they'll make you work hard for it. Um, so, um, Are you the one in the middle of the circle? Uh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think we've all been a part of it in the middle of that circle. Yeah. Um, just, I'm sure there's questions from the floor related to your piece. Finally, would it be fair to say that um, Nyapa Nyapa Unipingu was a tribute to her? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think for an artist, and, I, and also I think she is a continuation of our stories that draws on tradition. She always, she's truly the spirit of what we're about in this company and, and, and we're about you know, this contemporary company in the 21st century that hang on to traditions and pay respect to that and honour and caretake the spirit of that and we evolve that into our contemporary expression of today. So it really is paying homage to her but also to all the inspirations of our culture that have inspired our works over the years. Thank you, Dr Stephen. Um, we've been joined on the stage by Jasmine Shepherd, obviously who choreographed Mac as Stephen... Nurse Shepherd. <laughs> as Stephen mentioned, um, it... First, was first performed in 2013 as part of Dance Clan. We've got next to Stephen, we've got Daniel Riley, and oh, then both. Both. no, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, we, we rehearsed oh, this, she, and I did say I know. And she said, "Can you get the mic up and he'll who's, always direct?" Who's and doing I can't be this? Quiet. I'm doing this, right? <laughs> okay, my feet just went up. Uh, so next to Stephen, we have Daniel Riley, and next to Daniel, we have like a four barrel name, and I did want to ask you about that. We've got Bo Dean Riley Smith, and uh, Miyagam, Wiradjuri way for family, touched my heart and I, it's the second time I saw it tonight and it was actually even more special this evening. I th before we talk about the process of creation and concept, I, I'm really interested in knowing the moment, these two are a mob, the moment that you both recognised that you were family and the impact, starting with Bo, if I may, if I may the impact that that had on you as a dancer and what it's like being a family within the Bangara family because family is such an important part of Bangara. Um, hey, guys. Um, the well, I remember seeing Dan first dance um, in 2011 when I was still studying at NASDA and I didn't know who he was but I remember seeing him do this Wiradjuri solo from Stephen's work, ID, and it really inspired me and... I remember thinking, wow, wow, I, I want to be that person. And um, so that was the first time I actually saw Dan dance, not knowing that we were family or related. Um, and then it wasn't until I auditioned the, uh, a year later, um, I was speaking to my auntie and my auntie told me to say hello to Daniel. And I just didn't connect the dots. I didn't know that his last name was Riley. Um, I just knew him as Dan. Um, so yeah, that was that was the first, and I got a bit shame at the auditions. I didn't want to say hello, or you know, I didn't want to. I really wanted to make it on my own. I, I was like, oh, I don't want to like go on big night, go you're my cousin and get favor favoritism or something like that. Um, well, you'd be the only black fellow that didn't, but keep going. <laughs> no, but that's not. I wanted to. I don't know. I get real shy. Um, anyway, so so that was that was really the first moment when I knew that I was related to him was through that audition and then I, I don't think it was until when I first joined that I was like, oh, hey, I need I said hello. Um, we're related. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, then, oh, sorry. Yep. I was going to say, Daniel, you knew. You knew at the time, though. Is that right? Um, I don't remember. I remember the audition very well. Uh, I remember really working him, like really pushing him. Uh, yeah, I do remember that audition really well. Um, he was different, different man, different dancer then. Um, no, but it was, it was it was mainly just before he joined. I think Stephen maybe mentioned that we were bringing Bo on, and I was like, oh, he's got Riley, and Stephen's like, yeah, um, I think you're connected, and that for me was really a. Um, it was a surreal moment because I've never been, I've never grown up surrounded by a family, but by indigenous family, by my, by my, my connections back to country and back to Wiradjuri country. You know, um, apart from my father, and my father unfortunately didn't get to grow up around it. Um, so for me, it was a real surreal moment. And then through 2013, um, 
Stephen and I were creating at the time and I created a men's work. Um, and I remember Bo and I having these conversations about Wiradjuri men and though, through those conversations we got to know each other really well and more of a kinship level and, uh, and then that, that kind of has gone on and on and on and on until Mia Gun happened uh, and Bo had this idea about bringing a Wiradjuri story to the stage. Uh, he took that to Stephen. Stephen thought it was a great idea and then thought it would be really interesting and a little bit of um, an experiment for Stephen to see how Bo and I would work together to create a work. Um, I loved the idea because for me, it, gave, it again, it gave me a window, a little kind of Alice in Wonderland door into connection to culture and into connection to, to who I am and, uh, and, what, and how important that connection is. And uh, so I've really, you know, through the process of me again, really being able to directly connect to my direct lineage and Bo, you know, Bo and I shared lineage, which is what the work is about. It's about our, our shared lineage through our great-great-grandfather who grew up on Talbriga Reserve in the early 1900s. Uh, so through that, it's been really amazing to connect directly to my direct blood. You know? and, and every day we connect to culture and we connect to language and song and story. And, but to connect to something so personal was, um, has been really quite a beautiful thing. Um, thank you. Um, Bo, do you want to talk a little bit about the actual concept of Mia Gun and then the process of creating this piece together? So it's easy, like, it's like writing, it's easy to do a story by yourself but then when you collaborate there's challenges, there's joys as well. So what about, how did the process work and who's Arnie Dye and Arnie Lynn? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I'll, I'll say Arnie Dye and Arnie Lynn are the cultural consultants for the work. Uh, they're my father's older sisters, um, both strong, proud Wiradjuri women. One's an academic and one's very philosophical and lives on country and practices um, her language and, um, and practice the culture back home. Um, so the process really came from, um, I, I suppose, as a young adult yearning to know who you are and, and, and what's your identity. You know, I always grew up knowing that I was Aboriginal and being proud of it. I knew that I was a Radjuri, but in, in just passing conversations with my aunties and, you know, every now and again, they would feed me something, feed me some more knowledge. Um, and I spoke with Annie Lynn a lot. Annie Lynn is a um, academic. She's a lecturer at uh, Sydney University. And she developed this really beautiful kinship uh, module, kinship kinship presentation, um, a generic one. And then it got me thinking, wouldn't this be beautiful on a stage? And what is my um, my lineage and, and, and what is that totemic system? And so in Wiradjuri culture, uh, the, it's a four totemic system. You have four totems. You know, we're quite greedy. We don't have one, we have four. Um, and so you have your totem and you have your nation totem and everyone has that and that's what uh, I suppose connects everyone together and that's the Guga, uh, the Goenna. And then it becomes quite more specific um, in terms of location, like your suburbs. Um, and then, so mine is, well both of ours, is the Wille, which is the brush tail possum and that's the people of Dubbo, the Dubbogar people. Th that clan and then you get you break that down even further and then you get into your family names uh, so mine is the Riley which is the Wombone which is the grey kangaroo um, Dan is Murray which is the red kangaroo and then you get even more specific about it uh, and, and you get your own individual totem and so mine is the Malian which is the wedge tail eagle and so through this, I suppose, totemic system... Oh, and there's also two, mo two moieties. There's a moiety system, Dilby and Kupathan. Um, and so within this totemic system, it truly, I suppose, uh, it creates those social responsibilities and social behaviours between one another and, um, and cultural responsibilities. And also it just really... It establishes your identity and uh, within the system it manipulates, it, it's, it's 
you're born into it. It's already, it, what's the word, preordained. It, it's, yeah, before you even thought of, you already, you're set. You know who you are before you're even born, uh, which, I, which I found quite fascinating. Um, so anyway, that was a long story. Uh, that, that's what I suppose really fascinated me about, um, about doing a work about kinship. And so I, I think me and Stephen really spoke, uh, there was a couple of ideas, but I thought that at the time, uh, I think I was in my second year, I was very persistent. I was like, Stephen, I want to create a work. Dan created in his fourth year, I want to create. So I was always using Dan as a platform <laughs> with everything, you know, constantly inspired. Um, by him, I guess. Um, what was I talking about? I just went on a little tangent. As um, Michael McDaniel, the chair of Bangara, would say, we're not lineal storytellers. Um, the question was about the process of developing oh the yeah, piece. Oh, yeah, the process. And then, yeah, so me and, me and Stephen were talking um, a lot. And this, this kind of idea, I suppose, I thought would, being, would be good as a great first work. And I guess I was a little bit homesick as well. Um, so, you know, we spoke to Stephen and, um, well, I spoke to Stephen and then Stephen spoke to Dan and then thought this would be a really great family affair kind of work and um, and then, yeah, spoke to Dan and then, you know, now, well, I always thought, you know, wow, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, that Stephen, you know, got Dan on, on board and spoke with Dan because, you know, it's a work about family. So... Um, kind of makes sense that uh, two relations, two cousins, you know, um, you know, come together and, and create this work. And um, so we, within that process, me, me and Dan, you know, we went back to country and I took him home to meet the family for the first time. And he was a little bit nervous, took him to a family reunion, which just happened to... Um, the family re reunion was, I think, just a week after we started creating Miyagan. So it's, it's, it was just quite beautiful that that reunion that I suppose was planned like two years in advance just happened to be at that time and at that place for us. Um, so we went back home and we heard stories and made weaving, um, did some um, weaving and just just spoke to the people and to those that used to live out at Tabu Gra, those old, old kind of old stories and old people out there and um, I'm on a little tangent for what I was talking about. Um, is Daniel, is there anything you'd like to add to that before we have a quick yarn with Jazzy? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking how awesome it's going to be <laughs> that, that was, Wiradjuri, was kind of all over it. So yeah. uh, Mia Garn's going to be in New York and Paris. I thought I was thinking this is... A, Okay, well, we might pass it on to Jasmine if that's okay. Um, we're restricted to two mics. Now, Jasmine, congratulations on Mac. It, it was this Thank evening you. even more powerful and challenging and thought-provoking, heart-wrenching at times um, than it was on opening night for me. But I think, as I did on Friday, it's essential viewing, I think, for all Australians. I know that you have a, a love of history I know it's important for you to understand the history of the area where you live and work, even if it's not your country. So there are many stories that could have been told through dance in terms of the history of this country. What was it that drove you to do something like Mac? Um, I think the thing that really didn't leave my mind was how well-loved Governor Macquarie was and how he's held in such esteem and... Um, when I first heard about the, the massacres out at Appen in 1816, um, one of the things that kept coming back was that that was a missing part of history and there was this other side that was, wow, the father of Australia, he did all this, he was loved, like, was almost like a hero and there was definitely a voice that was being shut out and I... It, it kind of stuck with me for a long time, really, since about 2006. And, um, I, yeah, I think that's the reason why I wanted to tell it, to, to give uh, a voice to the Darawal people who um, 
who suffered at, at these hands. And um, yeah, so that was quite important. And I know you're interested in education. You're, it, to you, it's important that this piece is seen as a work to teach people about history. We have a national curriculum in Australia that um, insists that we have Indigenous perspectives in the classroom. How is dance, and, and actually it was dance theatre, there was a lot of theatre in your piece, how is that a better medium for teaching young people, or, and even older people, but particularly in the classroom? Oh, well, I think um, the beautiful thing about dance is that it it speaks without words and you can convey feeling and you can convey um, experience and raw emotion without having to spell it out on paper and um, and it uses everything, like all of your senses, your, your eyes, your, your hearing, and you can feel the energy from the, the dancers on stage and, and from the audience as well. And I. I think that um, it it really grabs you in a way that reading it in a textbook just can't. I'm just thinking about another Bangara piece that was about historical, so Debbie and Ipon. So I think Francis Rings choreographed yeah. that. Uh, Debbie and Ipon is on your $50 note. He was an inventor. He was an Aranjuri man from uh, Point Maclay in South Australia. And um, he invented and patented about ten different inventions. And so Bangara did a piece. Um, I'm wondering, are there any other da other dance pieces about around history that inspired you, or that you would recommend other people consider? Um, yeah, definitely in Ipon. I think we've always worked with an element of history. I mean, part of about um, yeah. Oh, I'm going to give you the mic. I want to ask you in, in apropos of that. What role does Bangara see when you're as artistic director for the last 25 years? Obviously, you started as a 12-year-old. Um, <laughs> what role does Bangara see in your work? What's the priority for having an educational focus? Oh, look, it's it's always a priority, and I, and I think also is we're constantly re-educating ourselves as well. I mean, we never want to stop learning to the day we move on and die, I suppose. I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about our culture is what's been assimilated. You spend your whole <laughs> professional adulthood reconnecting and re-educating yourself. So it's totally always educational to me, even if you're just having communicating amongst ourselves about, you know, when we go overseas and we go to another country and it makes us reflect more about our own backyard. Um, it's sad you go through touring Germany for five weeks and, you know, the Germans know more about you, <laughs> your country, than your own people back here. You know more about your country. I know they've got all our artifacts and so forth there. But, um, <laughs> but, 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 we, but you know what I mean. I, I think, look, for Bangara, what's it, 27 years, there's about, about 36 works. There's a wonderful thematic diversity about what we're inspired by. You know, first off, it was about the traditional dance and the mythological and the more creation stories and the totemic system. And it was a little bit sort of traditional ro romanticism. And then we went into black social issues and what's happening in the, in the present moment day. And then it was, you know, we can have a black perspective about history as well. And, and I suppose where Yanayapon and Mathena and Paddy Garang and Mac came from. And next year, we're doing a work, a full-length work, uh, work based on Benelong. So... Um, you know, there's a whole array of diversity and now reconnection works about connecting back in this urban time about uh, the kinship systems. Um, so there's a, a beautiful sort of, um, you know, an array of um, glossary of, of, of um, diverse themes that we're able to draw, draw on. But that just shows you the, the diversity of our culture and, and the wonderful complexity that there is. And how talented we are. <laughs> and humble. <laughs> Um, one quick question for Jazzy now, if people want to prepare themselves to ask a question. Jasmine, have you got anything in mind for, for another, another historical piece? They will get another yeah, I, I actually do. I've spoken to Stephen already about it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think... I know, I said I was doing better like Jess like, I want to do Barangaroo. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be a lot of... Yeah. I was just wondering, because I just released a novel about the Cowra breakout in a Rambi mission during World War II, and I thought, oh, imagine if someone could turn that into a dance piece. No oh, pressure. Sure. Are there <laughs> any questions from the floor? Are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Okay. Um, 
So the question was... Um, the question was about which sort of medium sort of inspires, I suppose, the, the concepts of the works and how do we get going. They're a little sort of bit tricky at times. It, it's sort of... Um, someone said to me, oh, you know, how do you plan five years in, what works comes? And different things appear at... Uh, you know, there could be a visual image of something or there could be a social issue that's in our political climate at the time um, and then I might talk about it with the set designer and, I mean, usually I would, you know, my um, my brother David and I would get together and, and talk about little ideas and sounds. Sometimes the mediums are just sort of... Um, it's usually... Uh, for me, I always feel I probably draw closer to a set designer because of the imagery, but then if it's based on rekindling historical events, then, um, for, uh, for example, we're working with a, a playwright, dramaturg, um, turgical artist who's um, done a lot of work in plays and so forth and writing, and, uh, you know, she's helped out in a few sort of historical works. So, um, but in terms of the medium, look, they all get a go, you know, because the set designer has to get in the sets early because it takes a, probably a longer period to get it going. The costume designer, the lighting designer comes on. We pretty much bring them all together, and then the composer usually has to have the music or a draft of music up and going. So, um, yeah, it'll probably go from the director to the choreographer and then feed out to quickly the other collaborators. Um, but they all, they'll all bounce off each other, really. Yeah. And then, I mean, the dancers at the end of the day, they, they have it the hardest because you sort of got to get in the room and hopefully, you know, they've, they're getting the music on the day the choreographer is and then they're sharing the story and so it's all quite organic and quite intense. But I think that's the beauty of it, you know, because um, we do have deadlines to work to as we all have to respond to the wonderful Western system. It's the land of the midnight sun, so there's no day. And they were in the room at three o'clock in the morning waiting for night. <laughs> and they rang me up and said, Wawa, well, there's no night. And I said, oh, I had to tell them about the northern part of the country. <laughs> and so they were like crying. They were like old men crying because they, they had to sing themselves to sleep. And so I had to explain where we were, that there will be no night. And they just could not believe that there would be no night. So I thought that's a wonderful sense of exchanging. Sorry. And it's, it, look, I, I think it's so beautiful that, you know, storytelling is a huge part for creation and art and all of that is so big part of our creative kinship system as well. Um, it just comes with land shapes people, people shape language, language shapes stories and it just feels right that we're working in a profession where we can um, celebrate with all those mediums and, you know, language coming involved in music. So it just... We're so fortunate that we can live in this time and our moment in our present lives where we can caretake stories and be challenged by them and re-educate ourselves about them and, and also work with different mediums from right through from, from, from writing to visual to, to music to, to drama. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the challenge for writers mm. is to use the well, the English words mm. Mm. to try and use, you know, your whole understanding of your view through that language. Uh, trust me, my use of the language is better than my movement on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And, and look, it's a great medium. And, and what I love mostly at Bangara, it's so generational as well. Like, you know, listening to elders, look, learning and listening and passing on information. And, and I love, there's nothing more in my job than I love is to, to watch the next generation. Like, as soon as a dancer joins, you know, I'm always like, where's your mob? Where's your song line? Okay, you're not connected. Well, we're going to be connected by three years. And, 
you know, and it's a beautiful thing because we all come at it at different ends and it's just, they get to take responsibility for their own mothers and fathers and generation and it's just, no, it's a beautiful thing. When they talk about me again, it, that is the, the foundation of Bangar and, and it always has been. And we've just been lucky to have a lot of communities around the country, living language song and dance and reconnecting song and dance who have come to Bangara and entrusted us as a foundation. I, oh look, I, I just hope it'll, hopefully it'll be around for another 40,000 years. And <laughs> <laughs> the experienced ones, I talk about that, you see that. <laughs> that was so good, and I relate to that from my... <laughs> Elmer and Niblets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's even good watching Alma on stage, because she's 44, and, you know, in this com country, let alone an Indigenous artist being on stage, a dancer's contemporary life is a bit like an AFL football player or a basketball sport. I shouldn't always refer it to men, but you know, any sports player would, you know, you get to 37, 38, you start wearing the, you know, getting the steel hips and so forth. Um, maybe not that young, but, um, but yeah, she, she's still thriving as a performer. And, and, and what's beautiful, she'll become an elder in her storytelling, and there'll be roles for that on stage. So, um, and we have a rekindling program, which is our senior dancers who have retired, who now run our education resource. Like, we wouldn't be able to do that 10 years ago. Uh, and now that we have senior dancers traveling all over the country, just working with secondary youth, indigenous youth, and getting them to connect back, listen to story, and showing them how to craft a choreographic story. And then at the end of all those gatherings that they meet, they, they, they dance for their community. And it's just such a, another way of ceremony, another way of storytelling. But, um, but yeah, dance is a beautiful medium. And it's, it's one we heal through when we have big ceremonies. So, yeah, song and dance. Dance is a beautiful medium. On that note, oh, I was going to end. <laughs> well, I've got one more question. I have to ask, does the music come first? And then the yeah, song? we were just talking about that before. Does the choreography get created and then you have the music following the choreography? They all nibble at each other. <clears throat> like the idea of we could just go, oh, wouldn't Ben Long be fascinating? And then, oh, look, I probably have to say it probably it kick starts with me because I'm usually, you know, they say you're the one running the company and you've got to have the ideas and go out there. But I share a lot with the other collaborators and, and share what we should do and what, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, there's, it's, there's a spirit about it that just happens. I'd hate to say where does it really, how does it all start, but it all gets shared at one time. I yeah. just love what you said, bringing art onto the stage. Yeah. Um, what about like urban indigenous artists? Oh, sure. My, Dan did a work on Michael Riley's um, photos, the, the, the cloud series, that were photos, and I don't know if you saw that back in 2010, but that was huge photos on stage projected of, of another Radri famous, um, good, strong-headed people <laughs> of the world, of the good looking of the nation. Uh, and uh, I was only thinking before, you were talking about, and that's what's beautiful, like you have contemporary versions of that, and then we have traditional versions, this is a wonderful sense of a real circular feel of storytelling. And it's funny, with Ben Along, I went to the IATSAs in Canberra and they were saying, oh, he's one of our first authors. And I said, how can he do that? And he, they said, he oh, the they, nine, they said, they said he, mimicked, he mimicked Governor Philip mm -hmm. and he was the first Indigenous fellows to write in English a form of what they called Aboriginal English. And I just mm -hmm. went, oh, well, that makes sense. If yeah. you've seen the Macquarie Penn Anthology of Aboriginal Literature, he's the first... Mm -hmm. Personal, you know, the, the letter. He yeah. wrote a letter. Yeah, so yeah. The ben which is letter. what Ben Along Space Time. So um, you'll have to be in that. Did you see I'm Eora? We did Ben Along. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've yeah. done it. Right. On that note, <laughs> 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 <laughs>